back um, with another uh, podcast. This is going to be a fun one. Um, we're here at Leaper's Pork Distillery with uh, owner Lee Kennedy. Thanks for having us out, bud. Jay, thank you for the opportunity. Oh, thanks gosh, for being no, here. This is, uh, this, is, this is a dream for us. We just get to talk and dr- have some bourbon. <laughs> Not a bad Monday. Not a bad Monday at all. Are you, where'd you grow up at? So I'm originally, I was born in Mobile, Alabama. Oh, okay. And um, dad passed away in 89 when I was about... 12, 13. Mm-hmm. So mom's originally from Williamson County. Okay. So obviously we know Leapers Fork. Sure. And so her side of the family, the Lock side, which is my middle name, they've been in, in Leapers Fork since about 1805. Really? So really deep roots in oh, Leapers wow. Fork, but um, kind of come first full circle. So when dad passed away, mom moved the family back to Tennessee, mm-hmm. settled in middle Tennessee. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then just because of those, you know, kind of family reasons, uh, uh, came out this way and bought some property. But so Born in Mobile for half my raised in yeah. Lower Alabama half my life, yeah. and then been in, in Middle Tennessee for the rest of the half. So when did you get this property? So I probably I bought this property in the in the late nineties. Okay, back before you and I know what's going on sure. in Middle Tennessee right now. Yeah, I mean so, it, that's that was the time to buy. Wish exactly. I would have bought everything then. And there was no, there wasn't as much going on out here as there was uh-huh. you know yeah. then as there is now. Sure. So it was it was easier to uh-huh. swallow. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And then, what, what, what were you doing before you got in the in the, in the bourbon business? So I was uh, I actually I was in financial services. Really? You know, I, I was telling you up until about a year ago, I had a crazy long beard, yep. crazy long hair. But yep. back then, I didn't look like a you know, look like a buttoned up uh-huh. you know suit. Uh-huh. And uh, I was in financial services. And you know, kind of backstory into this is, <clears throat> I was telling Jason off camera a little while ago. Mm-hmm. For some reason, since I was a teenager, I just have always had a, a fascination with. With whiskey production, okay. you know, initially, that was uh, from a cultural heritage standpoint. Mm-hmm. You know, I had a uh, my family Scots Irish, and mm-hmm. and so kind of, and I've always been a history guy. So even as a teenager, I was reading things I could get on. You know, on on the, there was very little on other than the history of whiskey. There was nothing on production, things like that. So initially, just the fact that those guys over in Scotland and Ireland figured this out 500 years ago yeah. and brought it to the New World eventually. Yeah. You know, that kind of captivated my imagination <clears throat> to the point where um, my uncle, he used to run a little still. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when, when I was, I'm a little bit older than you, mm-hmm. but in the mid-90s, there was no internet. No. You know, and there was no, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's still illegal to, to make whiskey at home. That hasn't changed. Wait, it's legal? Illegal. Illegal, yeah. In any form or fashion. Gotcha. Yes, it's, it's illegal. So, uh, but he ran a little still, uh-huh. on a cocktail napkin. He, he drew out, you know, how to make a five-gallon still out of a pressure cooker copper condensing line from Home Depot <laughs> and all the rest of it. Uh-huh. So, uh, and then I had a copy of the Foxfire book, which Foxfire Collection is, it's a, it's a 12 volume series of books that's written on Appalachian know-how. Okay. So it's, it was written by Appalachian State professor uh, in the in the 40s. So he went up to Appalachian and just cataloged all this different, like you know, all this lore sure. uh, from, uh, from uh, home medicine to hog dressing. And one of the chapters in this book was moonshining as a fine art. Mm-hmm. So it was very archaic recipes and all the mm-hmm. rest of it. So mm-hmm. with that little five gallon still and that archaic, you know, uh, literature of the Foxfire book, you know, between those two, learned just enough as a teenager to be dangerous, yeah. to make some whiskey. <laughs> I didn't kill anybody and didn't blow anything up. So <clears throat> that so, was the, So you've been dabbling in, in for, yeah, for, yeah, for, yeah. for a while. For a while. For a while. Yeah. And it's, and it kind of grew, you know, the passion grew when um, I went to went to college and 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 moved back to, to Middle Tennessee. And at that point, um, uh, I bought a 30 gallon steel from a guy okay. in Arkansas. And at that point, there was enough literature on the subject um, uh, and the Internet yep. was around. Yep. You, you could figure out how to make an atom bomb on the freaking sure. Internet. We know that. Mm-hmm. So uh, literally anything I could just digest on the on the subject, I would just consume and just I was just really crazy passionate about it. And uh, at that point, initially that cultural heritage uh, uh, draw to it turned into what I call the hillbilly chemistry. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one thing that's always kind of captivated my imagination as well is that, you know, whiskey is essentially a flammable consumable. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds crazy, but distilled spirits are the only things we ingest in our bodies that are, that are flammable. flammable. Right. So sometimes if I'm out and people are like, man, what are you doing? Like I manufacture flammable consumables. <laughs> You're like, what? And then, but anyway, so you know, the fact that you can take three inert ingredients, being grain, water, and yeast, Mm -hmm. in a contraption and make something flammable, you know, back in the Middle Ages when this was coming about, it was in the, it was in the realm of wizardry. Uh So um, there's always been that kind of like mystique and a little bit of magic, you know, revolving around distilled spirits and and how you take those from grains to, to 
a flammable consumer. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And then whiskey is just it's a whole new whole other thing for me. So yeah. Gotcha. And then, I, mean, I was reading up on this part. I mean, this this has kind of been. I, I, it was like the distillery tract or something a long time ago. So yeah, uh, and, and we'll get into some of the production stuff. Yeah. But you know, as it's a crazy business plan. So we've we've been making whiskey since April of 2016, and okay. it took us a while to get there. So um, me being the history guy, the the original owner of this property, uh, well, actually the second owner of this property, uh, was a guy named Colonel Henry Hunter. Yeah. So Colonel Hunter, he was a true Tennessee volunteer. Mm-hmm. He went down to uh, New Orleans with Andrew Jackson, fought in the Battle of New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Um, came back, he was a uh, kind of fixture in the community, but he also had a little distillery, which he called the distillery track, was actually was on old Highway 96. Okay. But his main house was next to it. So, sure. you know, uh, ed- consumers are so much more educated than they were, than they used sure. to be. So we, when we first started, we, we bought a little whiskey from another distillery yeah. in Tennessee to kind of get us through those years to where, you know, we'll get into some of this, but you know, we, we, we touch every step of the process, yeah. you know, and, and yeah, my, when I first came here, <clears throat> it was, it was still clear. Like exactly. you, guys, you guys didn't yeah, have, yeah, right, right. And, and we're still selling some of the, some of the white whiskeys, but yep. um, obviously the, the main reason we're here is, is to make a, you know, super premium bourbon and Tennessee whiskey using sure. our local resources. Sure. But it takes time to get to that. Yeah, that's the problem. Like you exactly. open up, you open up, and it's four or five, six years down the road. Oh, until you, until you get to that point. I mean, it's and it's from a business plan. It's kind of daunting. You know, we're all family owned here, <laughs> yep. and so I tell people once. Uh, it took me three years, and, and people that are out there that want to start a distillery, you know, it's it takes a lot of wherewithal. No, I don't say wherewithal. It takes a lot of thick. You have to have thick skin. Mm-hmm. You have to you have to hear no quite a bit, especially in. Uh, the the mid or 2010 2012 when I was trying to get this thing off the ground, there was still a lot of misconception about the industry. And in the South, you know, we're a contradiction in terms. <laughs> Most of the whiskey's been made, you know, between the Ohio River and the Tennessee River, yeah. but we've had this weird relationship with it. Mm-hmm. So the county was the same way, gotcha. you know. And so I just wouldn't take no for an answer. Started politicking and. Mm-hmm. And we got a law change in the county in, in 2000. It took us three years to do that. Really? 20, what, what was the law? Yeah. So, uh, and, and this is getting a little bit of the history right. of, of the whiskey production in Tennessee, and, and I don't want to bore you too much. But oh, so, awesome. you know, until, until the last 15 years, if you thought about whiskey, you know, you thought about Scotland, Ireland, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Mm-hmm. You know, there was now there's great whiskeys made in Japan. Yeah. Uh, uh, Washington State's making some great um, uh, single malt whiskeys. Mm-hmm. But until then, you know, it was it was Scotland, Ireland, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Yeah. Well, Tennessee has a kind of a weird convoluted history with 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 whiskey. We actually American Prohibition really shaped the American alcohol industry landscape that we're still dealing with effects today okay tell us what we we had this conversation on our stuff what what happened with prohibition exactly so and i'll talk we're, we're, we're gonna get the answer here i, I want to get <laughs> with tennessee first okay so, I mean, get, get the answer yes my answer that so um in the south is kind of weird but tennessee you know federal prohibition started in 1920 mm-hmm. and it ended in 1933 so there was actually an attempt at prohibition in tennessee i want to say in the 18 40s or 50s. Really? So there have been rumblings of prohibition going on. Uh, after the Civil War um, and around the Industrial Revolution, there was there was the, the, the local saloon in Franklin, which we lit, were residents mm-hmm. here, had something like seven saloons on Main Street in Franklin. Oh, really? And they actually had an ordinance against that until until recently. So back in, in the, the late 1800s, early 1900s, the saloon was the poor man's country club. Yeah. So you would go there after work to, to, to hear of any job postings, get the local news, you know, hang out with your, with your guys and mm-hmm. all the rest of it. So the, the original kind of seeds of prohibition were started by the, the women Christian temperance movement. So Cary Nations and a lot of it in Nebraska. So the, the, the ladies were upset that their their husbands were coming home uh, drunk. Always, always at the saloon. Exactly. So that morphed into uh, what became the Anti-Saloon League, which was a political arm. So the, the emotional side of Prohibition was really the women's Christian temperance movement. Uh-huh. And then the teeth behind it was the Anti-Saloon League. Okay. So in Tennessee, the Anti-Saloon League was very strong. And if you weren't a member politically of the Anti-Saloon League, you weren't getting elected. Gotcha. So it kind of had a snowballing effect in Tennessee and especially in the South. But um, so Tennessee enacted its own prohibition in 1910. Wow. But in 1896, the state had 322 distilleries in it, which is crazy to think about. A ton. Kentucky had close to 350. Wow. Um, North Alabama had almost 75. And you could, you could extrapolate that kind of across the country. Sure. So 
the, the headline from the Tennessee, I think it's Tennessean from December 31st, 1909 says all distilleries and breweries must shut down across Tennessee tonight at midnight. And it lists every one of those. So at that time, there were 40 distilleries that had gone from 322 to, um, to 40. And then the breweries, there were something like, you know, 50 something odd breweries. But that's the way the American uh, kind of alcohol industry landscape was more similar to Europe. Everybody consumed their local whiskey, their local beer, mm -hmm. same way they do in Europe. Yeah. And then when Prohibition came, and just wiped all that away. Everything, everything's gone. And so it yeah. li literally cleaned the slate yeah. for it. And that's why you have you know, the large, um, that kind of became indicative of, of US alcohol was the large corporate players yeah. that were kind of an invention of prohibition, so to speak. Yeah. So we're just now, there's this renaissance in American whiskeys that I'm excited about yeah. that really are kind of, you can tie back all the way to prohibition that's crazy. So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I feel like bourbon and whiskey has really taken off the last oh, it's unbelievable. five, six years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's crazy. I mean, it's, I yeah. mean they're, they're, everyone's, everyone, I mean, they're everybody's everywhere. Drink, yeah. yeah. And everyone's drinking it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's hard as hell to find now, too. It's unbelievable. It's, so that's good for brands like me. Oh, yeah. So it's like you're allocated stuff that you can't get. You know, we're, tr we're, we're trying to be a super premium brand. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, it's creating a little bit of opportunity for us yeah. to where, hey, we're, I'm getting tired of not being able to get my allocated yeah. XYZ. Can't, can't get this, this, this. Let me try this, this, uh, yeah. this nice local brand mm -hmm. and, and see what it's about. That's awesome. So, but yeah, it's, it's, good, it's good news for you. It's good news for me. Yeah. So, like, with, up until, and you remember this, like back in the day, I mean, there was a lull in bourbon sales in the in when 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 clear spirits came along. Yeah. Vodka in the '80s, yeah. you know, it really took bourbon took a hit. Mm -hmm. But in the South, we never stopped drinking it. No, it just in college I drank a lot of bourbon and coke while you were on the football field. <laughs> so I mean, I was insane drinking bourbon and coke. But um, but anyway, now people are treating you know a bourbon yeah. like they would a fine scotch. Oh yeah, which 30 years ago that wasn't the case. Yeah. So anyway, it's 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 helped me out tremendously. Was this was this building here? No, so this this is actually an old uh, 1820s log cabin. Gotcha. So a local uh, settler named James Daniel. This was actually built north of Dixon, Tennessee, on Yellow Creek. And so when we found it, it kind of fit what I was trying to do. Once I got, it took me three years to get through that approval process that I told you. Mm -hmm. And so when we kind of took a step back, what I want to build, I love these old Tennessee cabins just because oh, they scream this history. Amazing. Yeah, and everything's original. So um, uh, an older gentleman named Kenny Smith from down in Lawrenceburg, I pulled him out of retirement at 75. <laughs> and this is the last one he ever rebuilt. Uh -huh. So it was, uh, it was he schematic each one lot, log by log and, and rebuilt it. And then you guys built the? Timber frame steel house all, out back. All, all that? So all the, you know, this, and this is kind of. It's been a hell of a process. It has. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and you have to, going back, we think in terms of decades. Sure. So it'd be like you play in. For the bears, but you're like, yeah. hey man, don't don't pay me for four or five years. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's it's it's, couldn't, it's couldn't crazy. Do that one. I mean, hey, we're you know we're we're skating by now. Uh -huh. but we're finally you know gotten last year to the point where we're releasing our own bourbon and yeah. Tennessee whiskey. That's finally over four, going on five, yeah. six years old. And you, I mean, and and for people listening or watching, like I mean, you guys do really cool events out here too. And yeah, you know, you have food trucks. You yeah. Have, yeah. Cornhole out here, it's 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 it's, sure. it's a cool little cool little vibe. Yeah, yeah. You know, we see probably you know Nashville is kind of being outside of Nashville. It's helped us get through um, what I call the lean years of making whiskey. Mm -hmm. So like in in 2019, it's not a lot of folks, but we saw close to 25,000 paid tours. So really? that, you know that yeah, that's I mean a, that's great. I mean we, we got we know what's going on. I mean I call downtown Nashville Hillbilly Mardi Gras uh -huh. because oh, yeah. it's like you yeah. know it's, it's something going on all the time. It's a mess down there. But so that's we get a, the benefit of those folks coming out. Yeah. And, you know Nashville's the bachelorette mm -hmm. capital, capital of the, of the world, world right now. Yeah. So yes. it's either good or bad. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depend on, depends on the day. Uncut with Jay Cutler is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Let's face it, sometimes multitasking can be a little overwhelming. Like when your favorite podcast is playing and the person next to you is talking and your car fan is blasting, all while you're trying to find the perfect parking spot. But then again, sometimes multitasking is easy, like quoting with Progressive Insurance. They do the hard work of comparing rates so you can find a great rate that works for you, even if it's not with them. Give their nifty comparison tool a try and you might just find getting the rate and coverage you deserve is easy. All you need to do is visit Progressive's website to get a quote with all the coverages you want. 
like comprehensive and collision coverage or personal injury protection. Then you'll see Progressive's direct rate and their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and ready to compare. So it's simple to choose the rate and coverages you like. Press play on comparing auto rates. Go to Progressive.com to join the over 27 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk about let's talk about what, what we got here. Sure. So we got five whiskeys. I know it is it's Monday, but it is after lunch. So That's fine. I mean, we're not doing heavy drinking, just some tasting. Sure. Um, yeah. So we actually we have five whiskeys here. Uh, our Tennessee whiskey. These two are kind of standards. Love uh, uh, love the label. Who, yeah. Thank you. Who came? You came up with that? I mean, it was I I couldn't. It was in my head. Yeah. But I had to have somebody lay it yeah, out sure, for sure, me. Sure, you sure. know. But um, you know, the still because we are distillers first and foremost is yep. what I say. Like yeah. we we. We came to the industry not as a money making, like just because we love to make yeah. whiskey, and so obviously the still is kind of center of what we do. Um, uh, the wheat stalk, we're a weeded bourbon, and then the blue iris flower is the state flower, of Tennessee. Awesome. So it kind of ties us to Tennessee. Love it. Can you explain bottled and bond? Yeah. So bottled and bond, uh, and this going back to some of the boring history stuff, yep. but um, bottled and bond was actually the first consumer protection act ever um, that Congress ever enacted. I think right. it was 1879. So back before then, um, actually it was 1893. So there were, there were a lot of unscrupulous distillers that there was really no definition of what bourbon was gotcha. or whiskey. So people were taking very lightly aged whiskey, adding some things like turpentine. They would add sometimes like shoe polish, uh, uh, things to give it a bite, yeah. and then they were bottling it. So there were no standards for yeah. bottling the consumer they got, there was a slump in sales. People, some people got sick. Mm -hmm. So uh, people like uh, Colonel E.H. Taylor, the brand, mm -hmm. you know, he went to a group of distillers that were doing things the right way, went to Congress and said, hey, will you, will you all fix this? Sure. So they came out with the Ball and Bond Act. Before we protected meat or anything else, we were protecting whiskey. Yes, protecting so, which is, you know, anyway. So um, in the Ball and Bond Act stipulated that that whiskey had to be made by one single distillery. Okay in one distilling season, okay. so from uh, January to July, or July to December. Okay. Um, it had to be aged for at least four years uh -huh. in a government bonded warehouse and bottled at 100 proof on the dot. Oh, wow. So that was the definition of ball and bond whiskey. Okay. <clears throat> so as a consumer, you walk in a store and you see ball and bond, you know that to be able to have that on your bottle, that you've met those criteria so that's, as quality that's, that's standard. What it means for me today is, um, you and I could start on bourbon brand yeah. and go buy whiskey where you're from, in Indi not where you're from, but sure. in Indiana yeah. or Kentucky. Uh -huh. So me trying to do things like, like we, we source all of our grains within a five or 10 mile radius of the distillery. Oh, wow. So for a little bit of our barley. Yeah. So trying to do that, we're, we're trying to make a terroir whiskey as mm -hmm. much as we can. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, with that being said, I want people to know for better or for worse that we made every drop of whiskey that's in the bottle. Yeah. So that the Ball and Bond Act now for educated consumers is mm -hmm. letting them know, hey, if you have Ball and Bond on your bottle, you yep. have to put your, your federal number on the back of it or somewhere on the bottle, it lets them, it gives them the origin of the juice gotcha. so they can figure out where it's from. Where it's from. And that's where people want to know. Oh, yeah. So for me, it's like, it's letting consumers know and our colleagues know that, that we made the whiskey yeah. from start to finish. That's awesome. So <clears throat> we do a Tennessee whiskey bottle and bond, mm -hmm. and then we do a bourbon uh, bottle and bond. And then we also, so our, our approach here is, I call it simple and honest. So bottle and bond is very transparent and honest. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's the way it's always been. Sure. Uh, uh, simple is we do our single barrels as single barrel cast strength. So this is getting a little bit in the weeds, but we go into uh, the federal, you know, the federal definition of bourbon is it's, and I don't want to insult your intelligence, no, 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 no. Um, but uh, at least 51% corn. 51% yeah, corn. Uh, corn. That's, that's all I know. Yeah. <laughs> it it well, stops there. Well, that's a big one. Yeah. I mean, corn, <laughs> corn is a, uh, America's official native grain. Okay. And bourbon is a fi uh, America's official native spirit. You can make bourbon in all 50 states. Yeah. A lot of people from Kentucky get really pissed when you say oh, that. Exactly. <laughs> no, yeah. And there's, there's, people, there's people probably saying that, listen, it's a, they only thought bourbon came from Kentucky. Yes. There's a lot of people. Yes. And, and. Um, anyway, that's a whole other history. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, so at least 51% corn Got it. has to be distilled at less than 160 proof. Okay. So when it comes off that still, uh, that's 80% alcohol or lower. Yep. So uh, the government wants to make sure that um, uh, you can control flavor through proof off the still. So like our proof off the still is 137. So you lower your proof off the still, mm -hmm. the more flavor 
uh, or uh, oil compounds, fusel oils, there are in that distillate. So like if you think of a vodka, mm -hmm. it comes off the still over 190 proof Hot. by yeah. law. Yeah. So it's virtually, uh, you know, the epitome of vodka is colorless, odorless, and tasteless. Yeah. You don't want that with bourbon. bourbon no. So that, that 160 proof off the still revolves around that. Gotcha. Then it has to go into a brand new oak container. Does it have to be charred? So the law just stipulates new oak container. Got it. So it doesn't say American oak okay. or French red oak. It just American, and it doesn't even say barrel. It says container. So obviously char, and we tell folks, um, you know, whiskey, American whiskeys, bourbon and Tennessee whiskey will get at least 65% of its flavor profile from, from the barrel. Got it. So when they char, we use a white oak barrel. Uh -huh. It has the densest hardwood of any American hardwood, which translates to a higher wood sugar count. So as they char that wood on the inside, those wood sugars are becoming caramelized, like mm -hmm. you would caramelize sugar on your stove top. Sure. So the caramel, all the color, yep. and then the caramels, vanillas, oak notes, uh, coconut notes, things like that are all coming out of the barrel to the tune of about 65%. Wow. So we treat the barrel as an ingredient. Yeah. Um, so, and, and a little bit different going back to these whiskeys. Um, so what, tell, what do you do with the bottles then? Or sorry, what do you do with the barrels? So then? what we, this, some of this furniture we're sitting on gets yeah. turned to that. And then gotcha. also we have, um, some breweries and wineries that, that, that pick them, them up and then they're it. aging things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, I mean, there's a whole other aftermarket for barrels sure. and yeah, whatnot. Cool. Um, so anyway, uh, we go in the barrel at 110 proof versus that 125 proof. Um, goes kind of, we do a lot of pre-prohibition style techniques here. One of those is 110 proof whiskey going into the barrel. Okay. So science has kind of proven that, um, and this is kind of nerdy too, but, um, uh, when they when those wood sugars being char uh, caramelized on mm -hmm. the inside, some of them are water soluble and some of them are alcohol soluble. So at 110 proof, it's kind of been shown through some studying. Uh, actually, uh, Seagram's did a big study on this and found that 110 proof, you were getting the best uh, kind of mix of extraction out of the barrel. Okay. So, but also us going in the barrel at 110 proof means we're coming out at around 107 to 111. So as a single barrel cast strength, they're very approachable. So if we went in the barrel at 125 proof, and let's say it came out at 132, yeah. then it's hard to drink that with. You got to put some ice on it. <laughs> yeah, it so <clears throat> for us, we feel like that um, the single barrel cast strength is very simple, okay. and they're all non-chill filtered. So these two are single barrel cast strength, mm -hmm. and this is an experimental uh, expression that uh, we did with uh, the Southern Whiskey Society oh, cool. that they actually selected a barrel. So we can try that if you want yeah. to. All but, right, let's um, try. It. Let's try where we're starting. All right, let's start with Tennessee whiskey. Okay. Do you have a favorite? <clears throat> well, so... Yeah, which one's your baby? I wasn't actually going to make a Tennessee whiskey when, when I started. Uh -huh. And um, some folks I was working with in Kentucky said, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice. So really? the grain build of the, of the bourbon is the same thing I was doing in my barn 20 years ago. Uh -huh. So it's kind of like my... It's, it's my baby. Yeah, you can do that. And it's slip. a weeded bourbon, and I, and I, and I kind of like weeders. Weeder, weeder bourbons a lot. I've been getting that's been that's been my jam too. Yeah, way. it's you know that we we think of grain bills yeah. the same way you would think of the bread that that grain bill would make. Matter of fact, as we were <clears throat> coming out with some of these grain bills, I would take them and make a, just a crude bread out of them mm -hmm. just to see how they just how they tasted just as the grains. Yeah. So the grain bill on the on the Tennessee whiskey is seventy percent corn, yep. uh, fifteen percent uh, rye, and then fifteen percent malted barley. And I, and we toast our own we toast our barley malt. Uh, which gives us a little bit of an extra added dimension, I feel like, in the in the grains. We yeah. Cool. So this is a hundred proof. Hundred proof. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. <clears throat> do you do it like wine? I mean, yeah, I mean, you, so, you, 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 I mean, you like you have a whole profile. I mean, like, I drink I mean, a lot. Of, I drink a lot of neat whiskey, but I will walk you through like what we tell people how to how to drink sure. whiskey. Give it to us. <clears throat> you know, you can John Wayne it back and yeah. and slam it, but we tell folks, you know, this is a, whiskey is an assault on the senses, mm -hmm. being that flammable consumable. Yeah. it really is. So you know, obviously you're going to look at first thing you do is look at color. Mm -hmm. So you know that has a good rich amber color, um, some red notes in there, but yep. all that's coming from the barrel. Um, uh, really nice color on that. That's pretty. Second thing we're going to do is nose. So I get things like on this Tennessee whiskey, like dried fruit. For some reason, I get kind of dried raisins, a um, little bit of cherry. He's a, I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a <laughs> bourbon whiskey sommelier. <laughs> no, I'm not at all, trust me. Um, and then I, we tell folks, like, on your first sip, you know, uh, really small. Mm -hmm. And we tell people as they're, as they're drinking that whiskey, to if they inhale, exhale mm -hmm. after each uh, sip, it kind of it makes that less intense experience. Oh. I 
I've never heard the exhale thing, but it worked. Oh, it worked. <clears throat> yeah, we tell people that's that's the main takeaway that people get when they leave the, the tasting room is if you just kind of dramatically exhale, it dissipates those vapors yeah. and just makes it less intense. Um, and on the, you know, we get, I, I tell people this is oatmeal raisin cookie. I don't mm-hmm. know if you get some of that. Mm-hmm. Sounds, I mean, people don't like, <laughs> people don't like Christmas uh, fruit cake, but there's a, there's a little bit of that in there. It's good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nice. It's really um, nice. And for 100, it's, it's, it's drinks nice for a yeah. four-year-old, 100, yeah. 100 proof. Yeah. Yeah. We don't, and we don't have to finish this. Oh my gosh, I'm going to. <laughs> <laughs> So, so that's a Tennessee whiskey, and a little bit, kind of a little note, and we'll probably talk about this in a Stillhouse. But <clears throat> one of the most common questions we get in here is, "Hey, what's the difference between Tennessee whiskey and bourbon?" Yeah, and some folks in the industry may get upset with him, but but really, the only reason Tennessee whiskey is not a bourbon is because Tennesseans don't want it to be. Oh, wow, and that's very true. So, um, matter of fact, when we fill out our reports to the federal government every month, there's no, we have to catalog every uh, type of alcohol we have, what mm-hmm. stage it's in. There's no box for Tennessee whiskey. So, <clears throat> the feds say, hey, y'all can have your argument down south. Yeah. We, we, don't, we care. don't care. It's bourbon. It's so, it meets thing. all the requirements. Yeah, it's got all the All, all those things. Yeah. The yeah. only difference is, well, on Tennessee whiskey, is before it goes into the barrel, mm-hmm. we have to filter that whiskey through sugar maple charcoal. And there's, the law doesn't stipulate for how long just, or for how what length. Yeah, it's just, just has it has to touch sugar maple charcoal, yeah. and, and the reason that is, um, sugar maple is, is a non-aromatic hardwood. So if we were using a hickory or an oak, and we were filtering that whiskey down through, it would pick up some of those flavors. We don't want to do that. So the the charcoal mellowing process is really, if you think about it, it's kind of like a, a, a Brita filter for whiskey. Okay. So some of those oils just that just are grab some stuff. Exactly. Yeah. Some of the heavier oils, it's smoothing it out. Yep. What the bourbon people say you're doing is stripping out flavor, yeah. and there's there's kind of truth to there's both of some argument to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay. um, anyway, so you, you essentially make bourbon in the state of Tennessee. Yep. And before it goes in a barrel, filter it through sugar maple charcoal. Okay. So the next, this is our bourbon. So we're kind of going. This is a hundred proof bottle and bond as well. Mm-hmm. I won't go up on proof to you with you until the next, <laughs> next one. <clears throat> you get loosened up first. And Jason, if you want any of this, here have your glass, man. Not a bourbon guy. That's our that's our bourbon guy right there. Brandon, mm-hmm. camera may get shaky. <laughs> that's why he's got tripods. So this is the one you this is this is your baby. You've been, yeah, you've been doing this for. So this was the the I would just it's a simple grain bill, seventy mm-hmm. percent corn, fifteen mm-hmm. percent wheat, and fifteen percent malted barley. So you know the rye versus the wheat. If you think about rye bread versus versus wheat bread, yeah. rye bread has that spiciness, has some dryness to it, mm-hmm. some pepper notes, mm-hmm. where um, the wheat, we all know what that is, mm-hmm. a, little, a little more flavor neutral, yep. a little sweeter. <clears throat> a lot of brown sugar on yeah, that. Yeah, it smells you know, sweeter. And, and normally, to be honest with you, we would let this whiskey sit. Like normally what I do, I'll pour a glass of whiskey, let it sit, just let it sit for five minutes and then come back. Cause so, it, so you, I mean, this is, I mean, this is, I mean, it's a lot like wine. I mean, you're, it is, there's you're, a lot, a lot of similarities. Let it open up. Sure. And, and people only did this with scotch until recently, Okay. but the oxidation and, and this goes back to barrel aging as well. We could go down that rabbit mm-hmm. hole with barrel aging, but, um, oxygen really opens up, um, the nose on that whiskey and it, and it has a way of mellowing it out just naturally. Gotcha. So a lot of brown sugar notes. Yeah, um, uh, we get some coconut on it as well. You may not get that. <laughs> A little sweeter. So yeah. good though. Yeah, yeah. You like this one? Have you had this one? I've, I've, I've had. Yeah. Yeah. I, I actually, I feel like it's got like at least the bottle I had. Baking spice. Well, like almost like a chocolate milk. You know, we've been getting that recently. Really? Yeah, some chocolate notes on it. Mm-hmm. To me, it's a, it's a little know. softer. It's softer than the Tennessee it's, whiskey. It is softer. Yeah, and it's which kind of counterintuitive as far as you know the the filtration process on the Tennessee whiskey. I think it just has to do with the wheat versus the rye. Yeah. Because that's the only thing we changed other than the than the charcoal mellowing. But to me, it's just it's a little bit softer, a little bit more approachable. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it's you know originally I wasn't going to release this till till it was about five or six years old. Um, but so what's that, four? This is four and a half, four and a half. around four and a half. <clears throat> the Tennessee whiskey around four and a half. And then all of our single barrels, we're doing it at closer to five and a half, six years old. Gotcha. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, is, is a goal, like, do you want to get, like, a 10-year? I mean, is that, I mean, is that something? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, as a, you know, as... And that's the problem with bourbon. Like, you, it's just time. I mean, oh, you for sure. sit there and wait. And that's, that's the, you can't, in this industry, you can't rush anything. Yeah. So, that's talking about in terms of decades, that's kind of part of it. Um, you know, what we're, what I'm trying to do is, is uh, release the, if it was, my uncle's my CFO, if mm -hmm. it was up for him, we would have been releasing whiskey at two years old. <laughs> so, I mean, but I need some, it's a balancing act between integrity of product and, and cash flow. And everybody's their own worst critics, yeah. whether you're quarterback sure. or distiller. Yep. So, um, you know, I want my standard, standard age statement to be about seven years old. Yeah. But you've yeah, got to kind CFO of. CFO saying, hey, we need money to keep this, <laughs> right. keep the lights on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a balancing act. Yes. And. Um, at four years old, I felt like, you know, we've been trying this whiskey, you know, we started trying it after six months just because we sure. were excited. Yeah. But um, we monitor it every six months. Mm -hmm. And then finally at four years old, which the way the, the, way the, the federal law is, if a whiskey is over four years old, technically or legally, you don't have to put an age statement on it. Oh, okay. So anything, there's, you don't, there's no requirement for age on bourbon. Yeah. If it's age one minute, you have to put one minute on the label. Got it. So if it's under four years old, yep. you have to put that age. So, um, we're very transparent. We mm -hmm. want people to know all their, sure. you know, we Everything. want an age statement to be on yep. there. So anyway, eventually we'll have some seven-year-olds on up to yeah. hopefully some 20-year-old whiskeys. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so moving along, let's do, we'll do the Tennessee whiskey uh, single barrel first. Okay. So uh, we actually, this was a local, this was a pick for a local uh, package store here in town. So, and this whiskey is actually at 106 proof. Okay. So it's, it's non-shield filtered. Literally, all we do with this whiskey is we dump it out of the barrel, we mm -hmm. run it through a debris filter, and then we bottle it. There's no, it's as, it's as true to whiskey as you can get. Wow. It's, it's literally almost unadulterated, so. You can tell it's a little darker by looking at color. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been blended. These other whiskeys are, are a, we call them small batch, and when I say that, they're, they're truly small batch. They're either a blend of 20 barrels or a blend of 10. So these are, this being a single barrel, every drop of whiskey in that bottle came out of one single okay, barrel, one, and you know that. One barrel, yeah, 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 yeah. Same notes as a Tennessee whiskey, yeah. just maybe a little deeper. Yeah. Um, obviously more robust being 106 proof. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it turned out nice. That was really good. Yeah. Have you had this, Steve? And y'all are welcome to have any of this if you want. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get done with the shoot. So, um, obviously, you know, everybody's clamoring over single barrel cast around. We've got a backlog of probably 50 folks that are wanting single barrels. And so, what we're releasing now it was, is a direct um, representation of what we were doing five, six years ago. So, I mean, and we, and we as we're going through these barrels, uh, we're finding about 10% end up being single barrels. Mm -hmm. So if we made 50 barrels our first year, that means we have five. So we started out with five single barrels for our Tennessee whiskey, and we had seven on the bourbon. And I'm trying to get those whiskeys over five and a half. You were talking about older age statements. Sure. So on the single barrels, I'm kind of being hell-bent on waiting to those whiskeys, get a little older, uh -huh. just because I feel like they showcase better. Yeah. And people want high-proof whiskey, you know, yep. for some reason. But, yeah. uh, people just want to get drunk, I guess. <laughs> And we handwrite all these labels That's for this cool. one. This I one, like that. You probably recognize yeah. the package store yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I like um, that. So it's, it's a fun project. All right, last one. Actually, this one I hadn't even, I hadn't even opened this one yet. Yeah. So this is this is our actually first uh, bourbon single barrel that we ever really? released. Yeah, and we did this one as a, um, as a distillery exclusive. So we sold it here uh, a couple weeks ago, and actually I think it sold out in like, within a day. Wow, that's it was great. nice. Yeah. That's good. CFO's happy. <laughs> For sure. So, so what's the worst part about the business? Waiting? <sighs> you know, there's really no, I, I mean, I'm, it sounds probably silly, but there's no worst part. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, Coming from the industry I did, I became disillusioned with it, with a lot of things going on in the financial industry. Sure. And so, you know, it's always a risk turning something you love into a, into a profession. Yeah. But I work with a great crew, mm -hmm. and they make my life easy. And everybody that we that's working here, you know, we, we're very passionate about what we're doing, and we're not looking at it just from dollars and cents. Yeah. So, 
you know, from that standpoint, you know, you got frustrations. You're trying to figure out, you know, I was telling you, we've been, we've been sitting here making whiskey for six years yeah. using local resources. Yeah. So now the whole, the name of the game is how do we figure out how to sell that whiskey? Sure. And it's a completely different industry. Yeah. So if there's any frustrations and it's not frustrations, they're just fun problems to solve. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's, and we've only got about 15 employees, so that's not, it could be more yeah. stressful. Absolutely. But um, I'm, I, I feel like I'm very lucky. So oh, that's great. It's, it's, fun, it's a fun industry. So we have the uh, single so, barrel. So this is the bourbon single barrel. So it's 110 proof. So it went in at 110, came out at 110.3. Okay. It's five years and three months. Um, only got 169 bottles out of, out of that barrel. Because we're not, we're not putting any proofing water back on them, we're mm -hmm. getting around 170 to 175 bottles usually out of the barrel. Who, uh, who does the handwriting? So this would be uh, my plant manager, uh, Matt King. So he's back there. It, that's right. He's got a beautiful hand. Oh, beautiful. I actually tried to farm this out to a uh, to a calligrapher. Yeah. And her quote was like something like four dollars a label. Oh, goodness. And then so I was like, Matt, and he has beautiful handwriting. Yeah. I'm like, I don't know where he learned to do that. Yeah. So he sits, but he he does all that. And when, we oh, only right. do that for for special releases. Sure. You know, usually two hundred labels at a time. If he was sitting back there, you know, doing twenty thousand labels, it, it would be <laughs> yeah, no problem. But that's cool. But we try to put as much information, like even on our ball and bond. You know, we're telling people the grand yep. bill. I love that. The barrel entry proof, yep. um, uh, everything, the age statement, you know, what kind of what kind of barrel it went into. So, you know, with consumers becoming more educated, they're wanting to know all that. Oh, background. for sure. For and sure. I just feel like it kind of kind of helps sell it. Oh, absolutely. For I mean, sure. that's 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 great. Cheers. Cheers. Hundred and ten proof? Yeah, doesn't drink like hundred and ten. Not even close. No, uh -uh. so it's really nice. I mean, it's. I feel like it's very balanced. You know, it's um, has those same uh, uh, baking spice yep. notes, the brown sugar, yep. things that the that the it's bourbon has. It's, it's just a little sweet. bit more robust. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little deeper. But yeah, I mean, a little deeper. But exactly. But still, uh, mm -hmm. very drinkable. Thank you. Thank you. Hundred ten. This Thank is you. great. This is uh, right here. I like this one. All right, we got All one. right, last one. We got one more. <laughs> it's getting, getting tough. Hey, man. Uh, it's a tough gig, guys. It's a tough gig. Someone's got to do it, though. Uh, we're going to have to reuse. Let me grab. Oh, we got two more. Yes, sir. Right, we got two more. Yep. Cool. All right. Actually, Actually, what do we got here? So this is experimental expression. Okay. So Brandon, was you were here when we, yeah, we did some of this. So. Um, special guest. Yes, yeah, a special yeah. guest. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, this is... Uh, we do a lot of experimental things here. We'll make crazy grain bills, like 100% malted corn, or we'll do, um, I do an Irish style triple distilled wheat whiskey that's uh -huh. sitting, on, been sitting on wood for about six years. So uh, one of the things we do is we partner, we sell a lot of maple syrup, it sounds weird, out of our gift shop. And a local guy up in, um, I think he's in Ohio, seldom seen farms, uh -huh. he has his own forest of maple trees, he taps his own trees, gets his own maple syrup. He boils that syrup down himself into into a maple syrup. Mm -hmm. We send him fresh fresh dumped Tennessee whiskey barrels. He puts the syrup in those barrels, lets it sit for three months. He'll dump the maple syrup out, runs it through a filter, bottles it for us, sends the maple syrup back. When he does that, he sends those three barrels back that are freshly dumped and they're coated inside with maple you syrup. Put your, you put your bourbon back in Exactly. It. So we Got take it. the Tennessee whiskey that's getting ready for bottle yep. and we put that in there and, and let it sit. So this has been sitting in a maple syrup finished barrel, finishing a maple syrup barrel for close to three months. So on this, we had uh, the Southern Whiskey Society come in mm -hmm. and they did a barrel pick with us. Mm -hmm. And we kind of, we did this as a, as a, just in a value add. We sure. threw this on the tasting yeah. and they said, Hey, can we buy two barrels from you? I was like, sure, man. <laughs> yeah. So we weren't anticipating, we just wanted to get their feedback uh -huh. and then they ended up buying it. So, um, well, I mean, I love uh, whiskey and I love maple syrup. So this, this, this might go Yeah, well. the back end, you know, you could put this on pancakes maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not saying that by, I haven't done that by, not, my, by no experience. At least put it in my coffee. <laughs> it goes great in coffee. I can attest to that. So on this, you know, you get the kind of traditional Tennessee whiskey up front. You get a little bit of that maple syrup on the nose. A little bit. Not much. But where you're going to see this is more so on the back end. You'll notice just a little hint of maple syrup on the okay. back. Kind of get that? Oh, yeah. A little sweeter on the back oh, end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, whenever you, whenever you read it, you're thinking, I mean, this is going to be... 
sugary as hell. Oh, it's not. Uh, it's not. No, even, no, no, it's no, not no, at no. all. Because you're thinking about, you know, you've got 53 gallons of of 110 proof whiskey going in there. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, it takes the, a lot. The, 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 ratio, the ratio is exactly, really really exactly. skewed. And this one, uh, it's about it's 108 proof. Oh wow! So it doesn't drink like 108. Not even close. Mm -mm. This is really good. Thank you. Are you guys gonna bottle? What yeah. You guys got plan here? So what we're trying to do is we're gonna let them have this barrel, and then um, this will be something we'll probably start doing from time to time mm -hmm. as we get those barrels from him. Sure. And eventually we'll we'll release it as as gift shop exclusives kind of thing. Yeah. That's cool. That's really cool. So what do you guys, you guys, uh, like I said this earlier, flies on me. You, uh, you guys doing events out here. You guys, yeah. I mean, tours here. Where can people find you? So uh, LF Distillery on Instagram and yep. Reaper Sports Distillery on Facebook. Gotcha. We do a lot of events. We yep. do a lot of stuff with the vets. Um, and you can rent out. You can do Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have here. private events here. You have private uh, events here. Corporate you've got, events, you've got, whatever. You've got, you've got all the things. Yeah, yeah, we're... We're, uh, that's been a good little side hustle, uh -huh. you know, while we're aging whiskey. Uh -huh. um, and But we do a lot of stuff with charity. We work with uh, the Green Beret Foundation. Yep. We do an event here uh, called the Bourbon Bash, which will, it's the first Saturday closest to uh, Veterans Day in November. Okay. And three years, we haven't done it since the pandemic. Yeah. So, but in 2019, November, we raised uh, about 150000 for oh, the Green wow. Beret that's, Foundation. That's awesome. And what we do... Uh, we actually tag uh, tie another tent onto the building. It's another 5,000 square feet, put a floor in it. Uh, we bring seven distilleries down from Kentucky, seven from Tennessee, and it's a huge tasting event. We'll have some, some talking heads from the industry, live mm -hmm. music, live auction, silent mm -hmm. auction, and it's and it, all 100% of proceeds go to Green Brow Bray Foundation. We try to do a lot of stuff for, yeah. for the guys. You know, That's awesome. That kind of deal. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So uh, can we go see the... Absolutely. All right. Sure. Let's head out there. Where, 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 do, where does it start? Where's so, the first start? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the process. Rolling? All right. Good. So that's uh, that's Kendra up there doing. Uh, she's cleaning out her mash cooker. Okay. So um, the process starts on this end. You know, cause I was telling you about. You know, we try to we try to so source everything hyper local. So we're growing uh, about seventy five percent of our own corn. We have a local farmer who harvests that for us. He stores it. Uh, the wheat and the rye are coming from within a ten mile radius of the distillery. Mm -hmm. Our barley is grown Williamson County and in Southern Kentucky, um, but all that grain comes in on this end of the still, pre pre weighed and batched, pre milled, yep. Yep. and uh, and then it goes straight into our cooker. So we're doing on this part, of the, and y'all can, you know, this, I don't want I'm not want to get too like in the rabbit hole with sure. you, but during the mash cooking process, what we're trying to do from a scientific standpoint is we're trying to convert all those starches. Like you and I both know, we eat a lot of grains. It has potential sugar in the sugar. form of starch. Yep. Our body metabolizes the sugar. Yep. So, through the mash cooking process, the enzymes that are contained in the bar in the barley malt, they convert starch to sugar. Okay. So, like if we were fermenting uh, uh, grape juice for wine or brandy, mm -hmm. crush our wet grapes, throw the yeast in there. Yeast is going to start devouring the sugar, yep. create the alcohol. Yep. With grains, we have to convert those those starches in the grains to sugar, and that's what the mash cooking process. Gotcha. Does. gotcha. So that's what. Kendra's up there doing that. She's actually just finished her cook today. She's she's pumping over, but um, I'll show you this. Uh, you can walk up right there, Jay. So these are two fermenting uh, batches of mash, and um, both of the we're making Tennessee whiskey right now. We'll make Tennessee whiskey until beginning of August, and then we'll switch to uh, rye whiskey. We'll make that for about 50 to 100 barrels, and uh -huh. then we'll go to bourbon. Okay. So. Uh, this is a thousand gallons of, of Tennessee whiskey mash. And, this is a thousand um, gallons. It's a thousand gallons. We'll get about a hundred gallons of finished whiskey off of this. And this, these are uh, made out of Louisiana cypress wood. Very traditional. You know, we're trying to keep everything as. How long will these things last? Uh, they say about twenty years. I mean, they're a pain in the ass. Eventually, I may go to stainless steel yeah. just because they're hard to keep. You know, some of them are falling apart on uh -huh. us. But, um, but anyway, yeah, it's uh, mash ferment. So. Yep. That mash is going to sit there for about three to five days. Okay. And it's going to ferment to about 10% alcohol by volume. Okay. And uh, so then once we're finished fermenting there, we're going to pump over to our still. And we call her Ginger because she's hot and redheaded. <laughs> <laughs> That's just a dad joke. But, uh, but anyway, so um, you kind of see the top of it. Yeah. They call this a Scottish swan neck still. Okay. And the reason they call that is a feature at the top kind of looks like a swan's neck. Yep. Very, um, this is very indicative of Scottish stills and Irish stills. They've been using the same type of still 
going back almost 400, 500 years. Technology really didn't start changing until the 1870s. Okay. Um, but anyway. Where do you get this thing from? So this came from uh, Vendome Copper and Brass in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. They've been building stills on the same block in, um, in Louisville since around the 1870s. Got it. So pretty much all, almost all the Tennessee whiskey and bourbon in the world comes off of Vendome still. So, and uh, it's really, it, I call it a functioning work of art. It is, it's pretty. You said someone comes once a month to polish this thing? Yeah, so we get it, I mean, just because uh, it's such a beautiful piece oh, of, you know, oh, we, we so try to keep pretty. it looking good. Yeah, that's great. I've got one of my friends who comes and he, he polishes it once a month. Polishes um, ginger up. <laughs> so going back to a little bit of the, 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 what we call the hillbilly chemistry, you know, we created our alcohol over during fermentation. This is All, a chemistry project. It really is. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing more elaborate than a, than a high school chemistry lab, yeah. but at its heart, it's a chemistry project. Yeah. And that's why I got a lot of respect for those guys, you know, um, these Irishmen and Scotsmen that figured this out 500 years yeah. ago. A lot of trial and error, yeah. but they figured it out. Yeah, this is an art. It really, yeah. And it's, and I, there's, it's chemistry, but it's also, I approach it a lot uh, from a standpoint of cooking a little bit. Uh -huh. You know, once you kind of understand the basic, uh, the basics of what you're doing, and you've done it long enough, you can say, "Hey, if I do this with my still on my temperature, if little, I do this with little, these ingredients, little, 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 little things, exactly, here and you can tweak yeah. it here and there." So, um, uh, the alcohol that's produced by the yeast eating the sugar, we're going to pump over to our still after it's about 10% alcohol by volume. And the only thing we're doing, very basic, trying to keep it simple, is we're going to heat the alcohol, that 10% alcohol, and uh, it's going to come to a boil way before the water does. So alcohol boils about 174 degrees. Well, Water boils one, at 212. 212. Yeah. So the alcohol vapor <laughs> is going to travel through that system up what we call the deflamator or purifier, uh -huh. come down our primary condenser, and then it gets collected in this in this tank um, as finished whiskey, like we showed before. You know, we're in the heart of the run now. Yep. That first whiskey you saw coming off was um, was uh, was the was the heads. So this is the heart of the run. It's about 137 proof, 140. But you can nose it. And don't drink it. You can drink, you can drink it. it. You can try it. You can sip it. This isn't gonna make me blind? Oh no, no, no. No, that's that's good, clean. That's that's the heart of the run. And it's it actually has it don't take big sweet. One. People are shocked at how sweet it is. It's really sweet. So you get the that's what the that's what that whiskey looks like yeah. without any uh, addition of the barrel. And super sweet. It's really nice. It's nice. Yeah, people are kind of shocked about how, like how smooth it, it is. So um, we'll collect about 53 gallons of, of what we call our hearts. Okay. Um, and then if we're making Tennessee whiskey, which we are right now, yep. as soon as that whiskey comes off the still, this is what we were, this was our uh, um, charcoal mellowing tank yep. that I was telling you about. Yep. So uh, this is filled with sugar maple charcoal. So where and do you get this? So uh, on Pinewood Road, up the road, yeah. Tommy Fox's Mill. Really? I, it, if you get the, if there's anybody here and get the top off, it's you. You can't get it off? <laughs> Ooh, I got close. It turned. No, Ooh. it's all there. It's all there. So uh, I did, but it doesn't smell like anything. Yeah. So sugar maple charcoal, talking about when we were in the tasting room, is it's it's not it's a non-aromatic hardwood. So we're trying to just use it as a, as a filtration medium. Sure. So this is what, so it's filled to here. That whiskey drips down through the charcoal and ends up in this tank. Um, What's the cat? This cat just goes wherever. So that's uh, that's Panther. She's our Panther? she's she's our mousetrap. Oh yeah. Yeah. So she she keeps. We go through a lot of grain here, and, and Brandon, you can kind of get some of this. So this is this is the Tennessee whiskey. So going, going through, back to going to the charcoal. What we were talking about is yep. is um, you know it starts as bourbon up top, yep. and you just taste it right off the still. Yep. This is uh, now we're saying it's it's Tennessee ten whiskey because we hit the hit the charcoal. Yeah, and you can see you know it's not adding a lot of color, no nope. color virtually. No, nope. but that's that's post charcoal filtration. So if you take a small sip of that, you may be able to pick up just a hint of maybe a little bit of smokiness, mm -hmm. but um, it doesn't change it much. Not much. Not much. You get a, yeah, you get a little bit of that. Maybe a little lighter. Yep. Yeah, a little less robust. Um, still really good though. Yeah. It's nice, yeah. So from um, once we get come off the still at 137 proof, we're using we use reverse osmosis water here, and we'll bring that proof down to 110 before it goes into our new charred white oak barrel. White oak barrels, and we barrel straight from the tank. And from there, you know that whiskey won't see the light of day for four or five years. And as it gets older, hopefully seven, 
upwards of 20 eventually. What would make what like what would make one of these go bad? You can't put good bad whiskey in a barrel and expect to get good whiskey out. Okay. So if the whiskey was bad going in, sure. the only way so um, the, temperature like does it need well, to be actually temperature is a big deal. Yeah. But what you're what you're trying to gain during for barrel aging is you want a perfect marriage between the barrel and the spirit in the barrel. Yeah. So uh, w by federal law, we have to use a brand new barrel every time we fill that. Yeah. So uh, if we let it sit, Americans are hung up on age statement because of Scotch whiskey. 40 years old, 50 years old. On your average barrel of, of, of Tennessee whiskey or bourbon, that newness of the barrel, if you think about it like a tea bag, yeah. so uh, the more Scotch whiskey and Irish whiskey goes into secondhand barrels, so they're less potent. We've removed a lot of the, the potency from the barrel with Scotch, with, with Tennessee whiskey and bourbon. Sure. So that new barrel can become out of balance. So you want, you're really kind of monitoring that barrel see when the sweet spot is. Sometimes it's seven years old, sometimes it could be 20 years old, depending on the barrel. Got but it. it really can't really go bad. Matter of fact, um, we want those wild temperature swings. Oh, really? So like in, if you're aging wine, you want that to be kind of climate controlled around 62 degrees Fahrenheit. Yep. With Tennessee whiskey and bourbon, we love those really hot summers, really cold winters. And what that's doing as well is that's promoting oxidation. Oxidation in wine's bad. Yep. Oxidation in whiskey aging is really good. I got it you. breaks down that whiskey and, and, and mellows it and matures it. So we want that whiskey in the summer to push into the grain of that wood yep. and in the winter to, to pull out. So it's just contracting in and out of the grain Going of that in wood. And out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Where's this guy from? So that guy is from Texas. Okay. <laughs> I was about to say, yeah. I don't see him walking around. Yeah, here. yeah, no, yeah. Uh, and a lot of these barrels, we stage these barrels here before, um, right before they go, before you dump them. Yep. So we only dump 10 to 20 barrels at a time, usually once a month. So we're, most of these barrels are between four and a half and five and a half years old. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you guys are doing your own? Yeah, so from here, you're bottling, uh, you're labeling. We, you know, we don't do anything efficient here, so, <laughs> so uh, we hand bottle everything on a, on, a, on a bottler. And then right now, because uh, we're in between bottling equipment, these guys are the bottling equipment. There so you go. We're, we, we're hand bottling you're everything right out. now. But, you know, it goes back to, you know, we're trying to touch every part of the process. Sure. And so... Um, Quality control. Exactly. So it all kind of, it ends here, but it's kind of crazy to think, you know, that whiskey comes off the still, and then five years later, we're doing this to it. So yeah. it's, it's just. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an investment. It's, it's, it is. It's, yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, I feel like we're we're making a commodity here. You know, yeah. it feels good to make a product. Sure. You know, when when I was in another industry, service industry, you know, it's uh, I wasn't feel like I was, you couldn't touch what you were creating. Yeah. It feels good because you're touching it. You know, you can see the fruits of your labor yep. and all the and all the rest of it. So it's 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 fun to watch. The most satisfying things we do here for me is filling a barrel yeah. and then dumping that barrel okay. five years later. Five, so, so five years, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. like it's, it's a child. Yeah, exactly. So it's, 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 a, it's a fun process. Well, cool. Um, I appreciate you having us out. Absolutely. Um, if Thank you're you. in uh, Nashville or Tennessee area, stop by the distillery, Leapers Fork, Tennessee. Check them on, out on Instagram, Facebook. Yep. And if you're looking for a really good bourbon or whiskey at your uh, local liquor store, Check this one out because uh, you'll be, I think you'll be really happy with it. Thank you, Jay. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks.